my cross-service is hard. I mean, really hard. And one of the reasons, because every experienced developer knows that even if project starts well, they all end up in the same state, like it's a big pile of mud with a bunch of obsolete technologies that is very hard to maintain and very slow to release. But microservices are different. Just imagine, you can release almost daily, you can introduce new technologies, try new languages, and it's a breathe. And when you start a new microservices system, it looks pretty much like that. You put few microservices together in a few days and they work. Okay, and then you go and put more and it's not that hard. It works. And then you start going into that implementation and finally you get to your MVP. And somewhere at that point you start to realize that that great promise is not quite there. You're spending like way too much time making changes and doing troubleshooting and implementing all that inter-process communication. And as you go like after second, third release, you may find, wow, that gets really hard. And if you look back, you can start to appreciate that simplicity that Monolith gave you. Actually, it was not that bad. Now it's really hard. It's even slower than it was before. And what happened? Where that bright promise of the future? What happened there? And you start looking what you could do wrong. And you're not alone. In my experience, 8 out of 10 clients who started microservice implementation on their own find themselves in similar situation. And the name of that situation is distributed monolith. If you compare it to what you get in the past, you can find that it's actually more complex and it takes more effort. So before you just worked on single piece of code, now you need to build and release multiple pieces, tens, sometimes hundreds. So if before you to make a call, you just call a method of a function. Now you need to implement external interfaces, client libraries. You need to test that communication, handle errors. So it's 100 times more work. If before if something happened, you need to roll back transaction, you just roll back it in the database. Easy and simple. With microservices, you need to implement complex sagas, track state of your transaction, and then on the failure, you need to roll back all the changes in manual compensation transaction. If you need to debug, now you're debugging multiple processes and tracing calls between them. So, and the more code you implement, the harder and harder it gets. And we know that complexity grows exponentially. So how did you get there? Well, I can share with you a few common reasons how teams and organizations get into that mess. And I'll start with the very simple ones that are almost easy to understand. So the first one is a shared database. And right now it's pretty much common knowledge that that should not happen. Like if you have a single database that is accessed by multiple microservices and you need to make a change for one of those microservices, make a schema change. So what happens? All the microservices that access the same database with the same schema will fail and you need to fix all of them. So that change propagates through the microservice into other microservices. And the solution to that that every microservice must have its own persistent storage. And if you have relationship between different entities that stored in different microservices, you need to handle that at the code level, not at the database level. So that one is a pretty easy to understand and pretty much everyone agrees that that should be done like that. 
Okay, but the next one is not so obvious. In the traditional development, many teams like to have a so-called test data, test data set or test database. So you just have one shared set of test data and if you need to test something, you just pull up the test data. But what happens with microservices? So if you're changing one microservice, it change your database structure, data structure, and you apply the same data set for a different microservice that doesn't know about the change, what happens that the test will fail and the test change will propagate through microservice boundaries to other microservices. And you'll have to make large updates to the system. You need to retest the whole system and re-release it. Okay, the next one, that is really interesting one because if you take 10 books on microservices and nine out of 10 will not even mention that. But at the same time is absolutely crucial for microservices because microservice is a component with independent life cycle that can be implemented, tested and released and deployed independently. But if you have no version interfaces, that won't happen. You implemented a microservice, created interface, then you implemented several other microservices that call that interface. And you're making a breaking change to the interface. What will happen? All the consumers that call in that interface will fail. So as a rule of thumb, every microservice must support multiple interfaces, the current one and then backward compatible interfaces. So if you make a break in change, you must keep your old interface for backward compatibility. And then one by one, you update all the consumer microservices to the new interface. And only all microservices moved, you can deprecate and remove the old interface. OK, the next one, shared libraries. So shared library is not always that bad. But if your shared libraries affect your protocol, and let's say you make a break in change, you change the way you serialize data, or you change the way you authenticate in your microservice, and you deploy microservice with those changes into existing system, what happened? All the consumers who communicated using all old protocol will fail. And you need to go and change them. So it's not incremental delivery anymore. That's a monolith. The next one is interesting. Let's say you build a microservice that calls several other microservices using client libraries. And those client libraries use common framework. Then you make a change in the framework and you updated one of those clients to use that framework. So the result will depend on the language. Some languages will resolve that conflict, but others will not allow you to have several versions of the same library with the same name in the same process. So usually it will take the oldest version. And when the new client will work well, the older clients will fail. So how to address that issue? Well. One way is to have 100% backward compatible libraries, but it's really hard to achieve. Another way is to treat major updates of each library as a separate library. You can just add major version as a suffix to the library name and the namespace. And from the language point of view, it will be a different library. So you can have several of them in the same process without any conflicts. And then we have a whole range of issues related to distributed monolith that related not the way you develop code, but more to how you think and how you approach your development. So let's say you have a product manager who gives you a long laundry list of features for the next release. And in order to implement them, you need to touch many microservices in your system. So it's no longer incremental development. 
when you touch that many microservices, you need to retest the whole system, and that process will take a lot of time. You can say, well, I can incrementally develop them, split uh, all my development iterations. That's right, but it's not incremental delivery. Delivery means that you deliver your product to the client and you will get feedback. But when you incrementally develop, you're not even exercising a big chunk of your delivery pipeline. You're not getting the client feedback. So it's still monolithic development. The way how you keep your code. Many developers like monorepos. So you put all the code in the same way, in the same place, and it's very easy to pull it up, compile it, make changes here and there, and check in everything with a single commit. But what that does to you, it makes multiple changes to the code, and over time developers will not, no longer respect microservice boundaries. So they will be reusing scripts, they will making calls, sharing libraries, and that will break independent life cycle of those microservices. And over time, that nicely crafted microservices architecture will turn into a kludge. The solution to that, don't use monorepos. Store every component in its own repository, so there is no way to blend that code and violate microservice boundaries. If you cannot do that, at least clearly define all the components within the monorepo and make your CI-CD pipeline such a way that when it builds a component and removes all others, so there is no way that developer can use a class or process from another microservice. Then the way you build, test, and release microservices can also affect if you are creating distributed monolith or not. So if you compiling several microservices at once and testing them all at once and releasing them as a one big chunk, and there is no way around it, so it's no longer an incremental delivery. It's a distributed monolith. You'll be working with several changes at once, you'll be testing everything, you'll be making changes in multiple places, and it will take time. And the more you do that, the harder it gets. And the last one that I'm going to talk about really gives me a very hard time. So that's called feature branches. Many developers used to do things this way. You assign to a feature, you created a feature branch, then you make changes in one microservice, another one, and the third one. And then there is another developer who works on his own feature, and he does the same thing. He also make changes to those microservices. And then you commit. And you have a conflict. And then you spend time resolving that conflict. And by the end of this process, you're no longer sure that what was changed in the system. And then you need to retest everything. And that takes time. And it's no longer incremental delivery. In microservices systems, it's better to organize the work in a different way. You can assign microservice to a single developer. And then, when you need to implement a feature, several developers will collaborate together and work on the same branch to deliver that feature. They will update and release one microservice at a time, and when all changes are made, then when the feature is complete. So, in order to get into real incremental delivery and respect your microservices architecture, you need to think special way. You need to treat every microservice as a component that can be developed, tested, released, and deployed completely independently. And if you're no longer able to do that, then you're getting into a distributed monolith. And the more you do it, the harder it gets. So, make your choices right. Happy development. So, if you want to learn more about microservices, you can visit our website at www.entinka.com and subscribe to our channel. Thank you.